please welcome back to the stage the CEO of Qualtrics, Mr. Ryan Smith. I'm signing, I'm signing this right now. I remember when that was being discussed, and we were like, how are we going to do this? That's so cool to see that discussion turn into an action. How are we doing? All right, we've got a, we've got a really special panel right now. Um, I'll get into it in just a second, but let me introduce two of probably the most uh, successful uh, executives that, that I've gotten to know in Silicon Valley. Um, they're two um, very distinguished individuals. Um, they're both very, very um, successful in many aspects of their lives, which is hard to do. It's easy to scale in one. It's hard to do it in all of them. Um, but they're two of my favorite people in the world. I want to welcome out Kim Scott and Sukinder Singh Cassidy. Thanks, Ryan. Where do you want us to sit? Uh, I'll sit over here. Okay. Go for it, Kim. So first, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, these two women who I've known for a while, but I'll, I'll start with Kim. How many have uh, read Radically, or Radical Candor? Okay. Woo! So Kim is... Uh, positioned a book and written a book, it's a New York Times bestseller, on how we should talk to each other and how, what type of culture we should create within our organizations so that we actually care about people and how we can drive and grow. But before that, um, you know, Kim was an early Googler, so she ran a small product called AdSense at Google and grew it from, you know, very small to $8 billion, it's a pretty big business, and then left and went to Apple University. Um, then she decided, hey, look, rather than coaching one group, I want to coach everyone. And she was a coach of many of the top executives in Silicon Valley. Um, I was fortunate enough that she took me on, and she is my mentor, and she's my coach and board member. Um, and now she's writing her next book. So it'll, it'll be pretty interesting. Um, Sukinder, Sukinder, <laughs> what, time, what year did you get to Google? Uh, 2003. So Sukinder's responsible for starting and running pretty much all of international for Google. Um, you left Google, started a company called Joyous, sold Joyous. You sit on the board of Ericsson, sit on the board of TripAdvisor Trip Advisor and Urban Outfitters. Urban Outfitters. Um, but we have um, two women who are extremely focused and right in the depths of Silicon Valley. Um, you go to a dinner party at their house, everyone's there. And um, we're going to get we're going to get deep, and we're going to talk about some pretty charged topics that we hear a lot about. And I think um, it would be a missed opportunity not to take them head on and not to be radically candid here. Mm -hmm. so, so let's jump in. Let's talk about gender. Let's talk about diversity. And um, it's a really, really charged topic right now. And um, I'm going to kick it over to Kim. And We're going to make it fun. Gender can be fun. It doesn't <laughs> okay. have to be this I, angsty I, topic. I agree. Uh, however, however, I, so I wrote this book on radical candor about how to have conflict productively, about how to have these great conversations. And then one night, I was talking to my husband, and this gender situation had erupted for him. And I said, oh, well, you should go talk to this woman on your team about it. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And he was like, I can't talk to her about that. And, I, and then I was like, oh, you're right, you can't talk. And now all of a sudden the author of Radical Candor is saying to her husband, you better not talk about that. <laughs> and I realized that's a disaster. Like we, we will never make progress on this problem unless we learn how to talk about it. And, and also how to work with men to help, to help us, how to ask for some help because very often there's a bunch of different problems. There's a bunch of ge different gender problems. And in order to understand what the solutions are, you got to be pretty clear about what the different problems are. So one of them is just disrespect. So how can, how can you as a woman respond to disrespect? And how can you as a man who's observing a woman being disrespected respond in a way that doesn't make the whole situation blow up into a federal case, but this just helps educate somebody? 
So I sat down to write about this. The new book is Radical Reconciliation. And I thought about it, the first job I ever had. And I was at a bank in Memphis, and I was standing by the elevator, and the CEO walks up, and I stuck my hand out and introduced myself as one of the interns. And he looks at me, and he says, oh, I didn't know they let pretty girls be interns. <laughs> And it was like, for me, it was a devastating moment because I was trying to be professional and I was, tr and I don't think he was trying to be mean or to belittle me. I think he thought he was complimenting me, but it was like, the, it was actually the meanest thing he could have said to me. And I had no idea what to say because you don't in those moments. And I sat down to write this story and to think about what should I have said? How should I have I shown this guy that I knew he wasn't trying to be a jerk, but it, told him in no uncertain terms that he had, in fact, just been a jerk. And I realized 30 years later, with a lot of experience, I still didn't know what to say <laughs> to the guy. And I put it out there. I put it out there on social media. And I said, what should I have said? And actually, a fellow board member at Qualtrics called me up. And he said, here's what you should have said. And it was such a lovely conversation with, with this guy because he said the right thing, but he also started by saying, you know, maybe I've said something like that. It's, I hope I've never said something like that to a woman I've worked with, but if you had just told me, it, it would have, that was all you had to do, would have been enormously helpful. So practicing these conversations, I'm working with Second City to do, which is an improv company, to, to like make this fun, like let's come together and companies are starting to do this. Let's bring people together and share these kind of little cringeworthy moments that happen throughout your day. And let's improv them together. Let's figure out how you can respond. And then let's get the guys in the room to play the role of the women. Like, how would a guy respond? One of the things that was so interesting about putting this thing out there is that men came up with these incredibly clever responses <laughs> <laughs> that I probably never would say. And, and for those of you who are not familiar with the radical candor framework, the idea is very simple. You want to show that you care personally. You want to show common human decency to the person who you're challenging, but you want to challenge directly. And when you can do both at the same time, it's radical candor. Now, a lot of these very funny responses would be in the quadrant I call obnoxious aggression. So when you challenge but don't necessarily show your you care, also known as the, the asshole quadrant. <laughs> um, but it was useful, it was really helpful to see these kind of clever, funny responses that, that I never would have said. So improv is one of the things I'm working with some companies to do to just help decharge the situation. Yeah, and in, in, in I remember you saying to me when the famous Google email went out that probably everyone's seen in tech, and you said, you actually took out or wrote in the San Francisco Chronicle, yes. hey, let's go to lunch. Yeah. I have a lot of questions to ask you to that engineer. <laughs> and he you said, if Ryan said that, I'd be dead. Yes, right? yeah. So, so that's a good question. Like, on the one hand, I'm saying to the men in the room, when you see these things happen, step in and, and interject. But on the other hand, God help you if you do, because anything you say will be used against you right now. And I just want to express a little empathy for, the, for that situation. It's hard. It's really hard. I want to give you one example of, sorry, my microphone is dying on me. Okay. Uh, I want to give you one example of a guy. Maybe Sukender should talk while they fix my mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's fixed. You can hear it? Okay. I want to hear the story. <laughs> so one example of a guy who got this just right. I was talking to a friend of mine. She was in a meeting. and Thank you. She was in a meeting, and the, it was a meeting with a partner, her, par her business partner, and two other guys. And, and the other guys were only talking to him and sort of icing her out of the conversation. And she was sort of on the end of a row and th th they were all, and she looked at her partner and he noticed what was going on. And he didn't attack the two guys for refusing to look at the woman or speak to the woman in the room. All he did was he stood up and he said, Liz, why don't you and I change seats? And now they had to look at her. 
And so it was a very simple intervention. It was like no big deal, but it changed the whole dynamic. And it, it, w there are no innocent, when you're facing these sort of small disrespectful situations, there are no innocent bystanders. You, you really do have an obligation to the women who you work with to speak up when you see this stuff. But you don't have to make a federal case of it. All he did was he stood up and changed seats. So, so Kinder, you've, uh, we got to know each other because you created something called the board list. And I loved what, what you were doing and how, how motivated you were to make a difference on a, on a topic that um, is pretty controversial. So why don't, why don't you talk a little bit about the board list and kind of what you saw and why you did this and why you said, hey, this is where I'm going to lift mm -hmm. to help this issue coming from from the, the, the woman side of it. Got it. So, um, so first of all, thank you for having me. What an amazing crowd. Uh, Kim and I actually were fortunate enough to work together for six, five, uh, we overlapped for a full six years, uh, five, five almost six years at Google. So it's so fun to hear kind of her speak and see her work. Um, I took a different approach uh, in the Valley and I would just say, for the most part, I consider the Valley to have been a place where I thrived. Uh, I kind of had uh, companies I started, Yodely was one, Joyous was another, the board list is a third, I was at Google for many years, I was at Amazon. And largely speaking, I can't say that the Valley was, you know, was, um, was bad to me. I feel like I found my tribe. However, when I got to the Valley, my very first job, I had just come out of investment banking and I'd been then working in media um, for News Corp in London. My first job in the Valley on the second day I got to my job and I was 27 years old, my new boss says to me, Sukinder, you scared the secretaries. And I was like, what do you mean I scared the secretaries? What could I have done? I mean, was it the way I walked to the bathroom? Was it the way I sat down? Like, what could I have possibly done? But that was the most miserable six months of my life because every day I had somebody telling me in different ways that I was too aggressive. Uh, I saw extremely volatile behavior from man, men, by the way, at the same time in this company. I'd come out of five years of success in pretty male-dominated industries, media and investment banking, and I just about quit. I was demoralized. I was pretty sure I was not built for biz dev. I was pretty sure I wasn't built for the valley. Every day I questioned myself. I was like, and I got increasingly, quite frankly, demeaning tasks versus the job I was hired to do, which, which was biz dev. About six months later, I quit the job, and I was pretty sure I was going kind of back home and leaving the valley. And luckily for me, I intersected with kind of five Indian entrepreneurs who, uh, you know, kind of had one interview with me and, you know, and thought I was great uh, and gave me a job in product management. And that company was Jungly. And six months later, it was acquired by Amazon. Uh, and I kind of ended up doing biz dev at Jungly and at Amazon. And my career took off. Like, it took off. And I never looked back. But I always thought about that moment. And I was like, wow, here I am 20 years later, and I feel like I'm the recipient of kind of having had uh, kind of good vibes in the valley. Um, but I can see the frustration of the female founders around me. Uh, I hear their stories, which are awful. Uh, even though I kind of didn't have those stories myself, I see them. And then I hearken back to my own experience. When I was 27, I was like, wow. You know, if I left, I would never have had the career I had in the valley. So when I kind of looked at all of that, it was circa 2015. Um, I was frustrated by all the noise around gender diversity and the lack of solutions. I was like, wow, how can we all be entrepreneurs and we talk about solving all the world's problems, yet we're not applying any technology to the solution of diversity or the issues around diversity and inclusion. Uh, and I want to solve it top down. I actually wanted to sort of start at the boardroom and say, we, you know, we often hear, how many of you have heard uh, in the audience, I'm just curious, that you know, the problem with women in Silicon Valley is that there are not enough women in STEM. If you've ever heard that argument, put up your hand. Yeah, I heard that argument my whole life in the Valley, including when I was very senior. Kim, do you have a computer science degree? I do not have a computer science degree. I do not have a computer science degree. Susan Wojcicki, who runs YouTube, doesn't have a computer science degree. Sheryl Sandberg doesn't have a computer science degree. I mean, this idea that entry level in STEM is the solve for all the world's problem, believe me, I'd love to see more girls in STEM. But my feeling was there are plenty of accomplished women you have the corridors of power of Silicon Valley are empty, and people are saying, men are saying, I don't know where women are to put in the C-suite or in, on my board. And so the board list is a crowdsourced platform where people like Ryan and Kim and myself and leaders who have business experience, men and women, nominate great women for board service. 
Uh, today we've got almost 5,000 people who are in the community. They're all CEOs and C-suite leaders, men and women from the Valley. Uh, we've helped over 400 companies find board members in 18 months. Uh, all the way from early stage to public. Uh, lots of companies you might know, like Fossil or Time Inc. or Shutterfly, Shutterstock, uh, including Series A and Series B boards. Um, and I just, honestly, I was just sick of kind of talking about a pipeline problem when I believe kind of that's a perception issue. And what you really need to do is kind of use technology to solve that issue and then show people the opportunity to really have access to 100% of the world's talent, 100% which is, I think, something we universally all kind of want to see happen. So this is, this was, when we first met, you were like, hey, I'm starting this board list. I'm sick of hearing about it. Yeah. Let's actually do something. So we sponsored the first scholarship. We gave you 50 grand. Yeah. And holy cow, she comes back a year later. She's like, I got 176 people. I got 176 high profile women that we have put on boards. And I was like, damn, <laughs> like, how do we, how do we do more? And how do we have more of this? And, and as you translate that, like we've talked a lot about the Valley, but you know, we have an office in Seattle, we have an office in Dallas, we have offices. We're seeing a different problem mm -hmm. in each location. There's 100,000 engineers in Seattle. There's not 100,000, there's like 8,000 here, mm -hmm. right? How, what, what's your advice for, for Utah? You both spent a ton of time here. Mm -hmm. We've got a different, um, you know, you're not diverse. You're an Indian, you're not diverse <laughs> in the in Valley. The you're not even, <laughs> here it's, it's diversity. Yes. And we're only 12 hours away in a car, yes. right? What's the, what's the advice you have for solving our Utah problems that are specific here, that if you look at talent in general, yep. Sure. It's not, you can't look at it that way. You've got to look at every single pocket. So, um, so I'm happy to offer a piece of advice and I just, uh, of course, want to turn it back to Kim. So I think one of the things that people talk about are the pipeline problem, and I can talk about the board, board list all I want, but the reality is a lot of the problem in the pipeline, and you know it here, is getting, getting enough women kind of to stay in their careers all the way through right, all the way through to be in a position to be a director or a VP or a CEO one day. And when people say, like, I don't know where the women in kind of are that I can promote, there is a question of how do you make it possible for women to stay in, which is, I think, I suspect, something that goes on in Utah. Well, yeah, we're 500% higher than any other location for someone who has a child that they come back to work. It's 500% worse in Utah than anywhere else. Right. So here's what I would say, and I think that the two things that I, I look at, and it's sort of what is the responsibility of leaders in that equation, what is the responsibility of kind of women or men in that equation? So number one, you know, I don't think there is a situation, and you all know this, where as a leader you can think about, you know, the, the women or the parents at the mid-level of their careers who are having young children and not think about the conditions you need to create to make it possible to stay in. Right? So you can't say I'm all for people staying in and kind of rising the ranks if you don't make it possible. And what does make it possible look like? Child care, you know, what do you do for caregiving situations? What's your parental leave policy? I mean, what is your flex work policy? And then the converse I would say is if you're a woman in that situation, before you leave, before you think it's a binary choice, I either leave and go do this or I stay at work, put it on a continuum and think about everything in between and negotiate for everything in between. And by the way, it's not just a negotiation with your workplace, as you know. I'll tell you, it's a pretty big negotiation with your spouse. I mean, I always laugh when people ask me about uh, being at Google because I was 36 and I got offered the job to run international and I was uh, one year married and pregnant. I wasn't pregnant when they offered me the job, but I was pregnant a good six months later. And the only way I made that work was with a, you know, a, bi a trilateral negotiation. You know, it was myself, Google and my husband. And let me tell you, on both sides of that, my husband sure didn't want me taking that job. He didn't. It was a big negotiation to make that happen. By the way, three years later, it was a big negotiation to have another child because he was worried about my career and we negotiated it for a year before we had another child. True story. And at we Google- don't, We don't have those negotiations <laughs> in Utah, it's a you sport. Don't. And at Google, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You will as women start, you know, continue to sort of be, as we know, economic breadwinners. Believe me, women, if you've got economic power, you have the power to negotiate with your husband too. And the con converse is at Google, I went in and I said, I can only do this job when I'm pregnant if you pay for my daughter and my nanny to travel with me around the world. And to their credit, Google said yes. So everywhere you would go, your daughter and your nanny would be there with you. Yes. For two and a half years, my daughter and my nanny were present 
as I travel the world, they sat right beside me, and on the other side of that person was like my male COO who got as used to having my daughter on his lap. You know, believe me, my entire management team knew my child. And that was just the way it was gonna roll. And I only knew my nanny too, because she was at every sales conference, she was everywhere I was. And I credit Google with making it happen. There was no HR policy that said that should happen. They just did it. Um, but they only did it because I asked. Otherwise, I would have made a binary decision and said, ah, oh, maybe I need to move to a domestic job. It's, it is crystal clear if you get up, and we're, 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 you know, a lot of the companies that are up here and a lot of companies in the room, if you forecast out from an employee count yes. of where Utah needs to be, if we do not have the full workforce, so if we're only playing with half the workforce, you're we not will not scale yeah. and silicon slopes. Yes, you're not going to get there. You're just not going to get there. Like I'm sure Kim has equally good advice. I mean, it's not only that you won't scale. I think you'll find that your, your marriages are happier and stronger very often when both people can do what they truly want to do. Like, I would be... I would be a terrible mother if I stayed at home, but I think I'm a really good mother working. Now, that's not to say that everybody has to make that choice, right? Or that everybody is like me. Everybody's got to make their, their own choices. It's also been really important for my husband to know when he's frustrated about something that if he wanted to quit tomorrow, he could, because I can pick up the slack. And that gives, that's actually made him more successful in his career, uh, and also has improved our marriage. So it's, it's not just about work, it's also about, about home. I, th I think we, we very often tend to think that there's this, there's this sort of trade-off we have to make between our families and our careers, but the truth is that we're going to have stronger families if we're doing the work that we feel that we were meant to do on this earth. And we're also going to have stronger careers when we have a loving family behind us. I think for a, for a long time, I waited for almost too long to have children. And I, I sort of thought that I had to do the best work of my life before I had children. But the fact of the matter is that I've done the best work of my life after I had the kids. Uh, they actually helped me. And so I think, yes, at least I think it's pretty good. Well, it's, it's funny because, you know, running a company, my wife's an entrepreneur. I grew up with a PhD mother who put my dad through school. And it is probably been the best thing in the world to have my wife working because when I'm traveling, it's not the Ryan show all the time. And how, I want to I wanna, I wanna double click on this because it's not that being at home is a bad thing. It's that it's great. the choice should be 50-50 mm -hmm. where you can make a choice to be at home or to come to work. Right now, watching my admin go through this with the new baby, it's not 50-50. Mm -hmm. It's like 95-5. Mm -hmm. The uphill road she has to take every day to come into work mm -hmm. is that much harder. So everything we're trying to solve is to make that easier. H how can we all do that? There's, I mean, you, you did it. You and, your, and Qualtrics did it to get me here. So I had the problem that a lot of dual career families will have experienced, that my husband is in New York and I was supposed to be here. I, I should have flown in last night. Uh, but you all were flexible and like moved the schedule around and got me a 6 a.m. flight so I could, so my kids could have one parent at home. It's one of the things we try to do is not travel at the same time. So I think it's exactly what Sue Kinder said. There, there are these little micro negotiations that you have to have with your company, your spouse, your kids, and yourself. One of the biggest mistakes I made once, I was, I was going to take a big job, and I did take a big job, and my husband was worried about it, so I had the negotiation with him. I had the negotiation with the company, and they, they really did a great job of making it possible for me to, to get home in time for dinner. In fact, one of my favorite conversations I had was at this company where there, I was the only one at the company who had kids, and, and one of the young engineers was saying, What's it, how do you make it all work? How do you make this having kids and, and having a career work. And I sort of broke down my calendar. I was like, well, 6 a.m., 
to 8 a.m. is kid time, and then I'm at work, and then 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. is kid time, and, and then I j jump back on the computer and I'm back at work. And he kind of thought about it for a minute. He said, it's kind of like baseball season. I'm like, what? <laughs> Children, it's not like baseball season. But I realized it was actually not a bad analogy. He said, when, when, when I was in school, when I was in college, I played baseball, and I always wondered how I was, was going to get all my work done during baseball season. But somehow you make it work, right? You just you do this juggle. With they people. say if you want something done, you give it to the busy person, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. But the thing I was going to say is you can't forget in this juggle about yourself. The problem that I had with this job was that I had forgotten about myself. When I told my husband, I think I'm going to quit this job, he said, but, but why? It's working for the kids. You're doing a great job at work. I was like, I forgot to factor my own needs into, <laughs> into the equation. So don't forget about yourself. Yeah, so one of the themes that we've heard is conversations, both on, and, and every topic we've touched today is like how to have conversations. We've got an incredibly young workforce. Um, you know, we haven't had the Google ride here yeah. really yet. Yep. Um, and so what we want to do, and we did this last year, um, the entire board of Silicon Slopes has paid for Kim's book for every single person here. Okay? You're going to love it. So this is logistically, and it's extremely expensive. So if you see a board... <laughs> if you see a board member um, from Silicon Valley, thank them for this. When people ask about the culture you want to create in your companies, there's no one that won't say you want a radically candid culture so that these types of conversations can exist. So please, everyone here, so um, text that. We'll get it. We'll get you on the mailing list and you'll register and you'll get it sent to you. But this is be on behalf of the board of Silicon Slopes. And it's a pretty selfless thing because everyone cares about everyone in this room. Big so. thank you to the board of Silicon Slopes. All right. All right. All Thanks, right, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, give it back up for Sukinder, awesome. Kim, and Ryan. Awesome. Thank yep. you. We'll leave this slide up so you can take a picture of it or text right now.